Welcome back, Nature and Code. We're in chapter four, and we just implemented a version of mutation where we developed um, a population of DNA sequences and mutated those sequences over time and saw how you know very little mutation can very quickly uh, generate a lot of uh, genetic variation. And this was um, the take-home message from a biological point of view in the previous few videos. We know that mutation increases genetic variation, right? So it, it makes genetic variation go up. On the other hand, we've seen in the, in the videos of, of chapter three that drift acts to reduce genetic variation. And so um, we're, we're at the situation where, you know, on the one hand, there's this force here that generates variation all the time, and there's this force here that reduces variation all the time. So uh, what I want to do in this video is I want to uh, develop a very basic mathematical understanding of this process. And I'm going to start by, um, you know, reminding you of this equation that we had a couple of videos back, uh, which looked like this, if you if you remember that. We had this quantity G, which uh, essentially was a measure of um, sort of the inverse of genetic variation. Uh, it was the probability that two randomly picked alleles in the next generation will be the same. So this is this G dash here. Um, and this was 1 over 2n, which is the probability that you pick two alleles, um, that you pick the same allele uh, twice in a row, uh, my, uh, plus the probability that you don't pick the same allele, but they, that they just happen to be the same type, which is g. And so um, starting on this basic formulation, we can now introduce mutation, because this formulation of the problem didn't have any, any mutation in it. And we can now go ahead and change this. Uh, and I'm going to do this here. So basically what, I, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to argue that there's something else that has to happen for these randomly picked alleles to be the same. Yes, you can either, they can be the same because you either pick the same allele twice and make a copy of the same allele, or you don't pick the same allele twice, but it just happens to be the same allele. But the other thing that also has to be true is that there must not have been any mutation because if mutation had happened during the copying process, they would not be the same. And we're now ignoring the very, very small probability that both alleles would have mutated at the same time into the same uh, new version. So what is the probability that they, that they did not mutate? Well, let's say we have a mutation rate, okay, we have a mutation rate of, uh, we're going to call this uh, mu, okay. So uh, this is the mutation rate per allele per generation. Now, the probability that there is no mutation in either of them is 1 minus mu squared. Well, why is that? Well, the probability that a mutation occurs right in one of the alleles is mu. So the probability that no mutation occurs in one of them is 1 minus mu. But now it has to be true that um, no mutation occurs in the first one and in the second one. So we have to multiply this and this is how we get to this 1 minus mu squared. So that is the probability that no mutation occurs in both of these alleles. And so we can take this now into account uh, by basically reformulating this formula just by saying, okay, G is now this whole thing that we had before. So 1 over n plus uh, 1 over 2n plus 1 minus 1 over 2n times G. Now we have to multiply this term with 1 minus mu squared. 
because that's the probability that no mutation occurred. And this is chi dash. So we can now uh, simplify this entire term. So the first thing that we can do is we can basically um, expand, fully expand this term. So 1 minus 1 minus mu expanded, 1 minus mu squared expanded is 1 minus 2 mu uh, plus u squared. And now we're going to make a, a simplifying assumption. We're going to say, well, if, if mu is, is very small, very, very small indeed, then mu squared is so small that uh, in an addition or, or in a subtraction, it really doesn't matter. So we're basically going to say, well, this is roughly um, this term here, but we get rid of this here. And now if we do this, so we can basically replace this term here, 1 minus mu squared, with 1 minus 2 mu. It's a good approximation. So I'm going to get rid of this here. And so I'm going to replace this term here simply with 1 minus 2 mu. All right, that's the first step in our simplification. The second step now is that we are going to completely expand this term here. So uh, what does this mean? So keep in mind, right, we need to multiply 1 minus 2 mu with this entire term here. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Let's just expand the whole thing. So this is 1 times 1 over 2n. So that's 1 over 2n minus 2 mu over 2n plus um, 1 minus 1 over 2n chi. So this is 1 times this term minus... 1 minus 1 over 2n, 2 mu g. So this is this minus 2 mu times this term. And now what we can do is we can get rid of some of the terms here. So, uh, well, before I do this, let's, let's, let's expand these things a little further. So g, uh, 1 minus 1 over 2n g. Right, this, this term here equals g minus g over 2n. So I can replace this. I'm going to just get rid of this. I'm going to put in g minus g over 2n. And the same logic applies here. Now I'm going to multiply this out. So this is 1. Uh, times 2 mu g. So this would be um, 2 mu g minus 2 mu g over 2 n. And so I'm going to replace this term and notice the minus symbol here. So I will get rid of this. Oops. I will get rid of this. And replace this. Okay, so minus 2 ug minus, but because we have a minus here, it's going to be plus 2 mu g over 2n. Okay, so we're done replacing this. All right, so this is now fully expanded. Now, here's another trick. Now, this is now just, um, you know, addition and subtraction of terms. So we can again ask ourselves, can we simplify this um, by saying, well, this is roughly, um, of course, this should be roughly here, approximately, this term. Well, it turns out that we can, for example, ignore this term here. And we can also ignore this term here. Okay, and why is that? Well, it's because here we have a very small term in the numerator mu, and we're dividing by a term 
that is potentially very large. Okay, it's quite large. And so we're going to get rid of it. And we're going to say, well, okay, except if this n would be exceptionally small, we can essentially get rid of it because we would divide um, a small numerator by a large denominator, which would make this term incredibly small. And so we're just going to get rid of it. And the same here, mu divided by n. So we are going to get rid of this term. And we are now left with this term. And so it turns out that you know expanding this actually didn't really have any impact. So we can just go back and say, well, g in the next generation is roughly 1 over 2n plus 1 minus 1 over 2n g minus 2 mu g. So a look at this equation. This is actually the equation that we had before, right? This is the equation that we had before. Now we're just saying this is minus 2 mu g is the effect of the mutation. So let's rephrase this like we did before in terms of h, right? Where h is now this uh, the opposite measure. It's if you pick two uh, alleles at random, what is the probability that they're not the same? So that's a measure of um, genetic diversity. So the answer here is, uh, as before, right? We defined h to be uh, 1 minus g, or vice versa, g to be 1 minus h. And of course, the same is true in the next generation as well. And so we can now replace this and we can um, basically get an equation here for h in the next generation, which is simply 1 minus this term. So it's going to be 1 minus this whole thing, 1 over 2n plus 1 minus 1 over 2n g minus 2 mu g. Okay, and now um, in order to have a nice equation, we're simply going to replace all g's with 1 minus h. So we'll have here h dash in the next generation is 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 1 minus 1 over 2n times 1 minus h. And then we have minus 2 mu 1 minus h. Okay. So we can get now get rid of these parentheses. So we have minus, and if we get rid of these parentheses here, then that means this term will become um, a minus, and this term here will become a plus. So Let's fully expand this equation. We have h dash equals 1 minus 1 over 2n minus 1 times 1, so that's minus 1. Then we have here 1 minus h. 1 times minus h is minus h, but we have here minus, so that's plus h. Then we have minus 1 over 2n times 1, so that's minus 1 over 2n, but because we have a minus here, that's going to be plus 1 over 2n. And we have minus 1 over 2n times minus h is plus h over 2n. But because we have a minus here, that's going to be minus h over 2n plus 2 mu minus 2 mu h. That's the fully expanded equation. And... Um, a few terms here cancel each other out. So, for example, here we have 1 minus 1. So we can get rid of that. Okay. Let's see, what else can we get rid of? We have minus 1 over 2n plus 1 over 2n. So we can get rid of that. And so we don't need the h as a plus here. Okay, so now this has simplified quite a bit. This is now h minus h over 2n plus 2 mu minus 2 mu h. And now um, let's um, 
let's simplify this a little bit. Okay, so we can say here h dash equals, I'm going to take the h out here of this part, so that's going to be 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 2 mu times 1 minus h. And indeed, I could uh, put the h here instead of uh, here, and then you would maybe recognize this a little better. Because what's happened here now is actually quite remarkable. We have an equation here um, that is quite similar to the one that we developed before. Remember, without mutation, we derive the following equation. We derived h in the next generation is simply 1 minus 1 over 2n times h in the current um, h in the current generation. And because, because there's a minus here and this term is going to be positive, we realize this is always going to h is always going to get smaller with every generation. However, now with mutation, we get to the point where we have the same term here plus 2 mu 1 minus h. And this is actually now quite beautiful because this we know is exactly the reduction in genetic variation or maybe I should rather say um, the decrease I'm going to say decrease u2 drift. Okay, this is exactly the term that we derived before. Now here on the other hand, this term is going to be positive. It's going to be small, but it's going to be positive. So this means that this term will increase the genetic variation and indeed that's exactly what we've established previously in code, that that's what mutation does. It increases the genetic variation. So this part here is really the increase that is due to mutation. And so that's really quite beautiful. So you have two forces here. One of them, which I'm going to circle here in red, is genetic drift. Uh, and this will act to decrease genetic variation. And then here, over here in blue, we have this other term um, that is due to mutation. And it, because of this mutation and because the term is positive, it actually acts to increase um, genetic variation. And so that's the simple reason, uh, a simple mathematical derivation of the fact that if you add mutation to this equation, you will notice that H won't just always go down. It's actually counteracted here by this mutation force, which will act to increase uh, the genetic variation. And I think that's quite, quite a neat result. Again, in a very simple, uh, sort of starting from first principles, in a very simple equation, you uh, arrive at major insights about the process of genetic evolution.